before we proceed any further, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners on the land where we're all That's beaming in from. Um, I'd like to, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge our elders past and present and emerging. And I'm talking from Wajak Nunga Buja, which is based in Perth. Um, firstly, I'd like to hand over to Sharon and Donna, who's the co-presenters, to introduce themselves, and Lee, who will be uh, gathering questions and comments, and who will be facilitating a short um, present uh, Q and A at the end of the presentation. So, welcome aboard, and over to you, Sharon. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Sharon. Um, I'm a non-Indigenous working, a, a non-Indigenous woman and it's uh, my great pleasure to work in a First Nations organisation and alongside colleagues like Doyen and our First Nations Research and Evaluation Fellow Donna. Um, I'm living and working on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Over to you Donna. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon and Doyen. Uh, my name's Donna Stevens. I'm a, a Muran woman from the northwest of Arnhem Land. Uh, my language group is Iwaja. Um, I'm actually on Arunda land today and pay my respects to elders um, past, present and emerging, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations people um, who are joining our meeting today. Thank you so much for being with us. Leah, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I will. Hi, my name's Leah Gage. I'm a senior researcher for um, Community First Development. I'm really happy to be here, and it's so good to see so many faces. Um, I'm a Palawa woman from Tasmania, and um, as Doyen said, oh, I'll be not. collating the, um, question, the Q and A at the end of our session today. Oh, Thanks, Leah. And i just a quick shout out to everyone. If you're, if you're not presenting, if you wouldn't mind turning your mics off. Doreen, I'll just bring up the slides for you. Okay. Uh, before we uh, get into the, um, get into the research with the 11, 11 communities that we work with, I just, um, um, some of you may be familiar with Community First Development and um, some may be new to the organisation. I'll provide a quick overview before we dive into the research and practice um, and findings of our recent pedestrian action research project. Uh, community First Development, as people know, we're a First Nations National Community Development Research Organisation. And our, our vision is to see First Nations people and communities thriving, and that's very important. We promote skills, talents, and culture strength of our people and facilitate activities um, that lead to positive change for our communities. And the, and the approach that we take, we, we actively listen and we, we share our learnings. We also take the time to understand the community's challenges and vision and build on local strength, knowledge and resources. And working with communities, we match skilled volunteers to the activities designed and driven by communities. We also acknowledge that uh, we work at the community's pace when we develop in these projects. Uh, that's very important. We don't just go on with our own agenda. We work at the community's pace. And that's very, very important when you're working in the community development space or, and research um, area. And from the very beginning, um, we embed with the community the monitoring and evaluation of our activities with the communities with volunteer input and participation. Um, you can move over to the next slide. Okay. Now this is the model that um, we work to. It's our community development 
framework is very important. Um, we've only just released it on our website last week and we're, we're going to talk further on another webinar about our framework and how it all works. So this is the key to our success and, and, um, and how we work with communities. Um, so it's, it is a practical, well-documented approach uh, that has potential to um, apply to a range of co-design uh, co and collaborative settings with First Nations people. Um, we invest a lot of time in the first two stages um, in building understanding. It's very important to build the understanding and the key thing is relationships. Relationships are very important. We just don't jump in and start building. A lot of groundwork is laid out first before we start working with communities. And that key fundamental is, is, is um, developing those relationships and building that trust. Um, when we work this way over time, we, we are building trust and that's key. Trust and building relationship with community members is very important. This is critical to the way that we work. And if, 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 um, if we work with First Nation people, it's a key fundamental, it's building that trust and relationship with communities, but also understanding, um, understanding what the community needs are. So um, here are a couple of quotes that have taken from um, our re research uh, report uh, where the community has explained a view how we work and partner with them on community development activities. Um, the next section we've got a we've got a short video of of our team and community members um, we have worked with and talking about our approach and 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 the ensuring that self-determination is at the core of the business that we work with in the way that we engage and work with communities. Okay. Everything we do is based on people self-determination. It, it really is. It's about being able to be decision makers for your own life. One of the reasons why I work with um, community, community first development is to get back what we lost over time, to get our self-determination, our pride, our thoughts, and to be first people as, as we were 200 years ago. I think it's like that they understand self-determination, that their specialist professionals have had a lot of training in um, um, culture and how to work with Aboriginal community members, that they don't actually dominate the conversation, that they let us tell them what we need and they come along for the ride. So they bring their expertise into it, but they very much let us determine how a project should go. I think there's a, an expectation or an idea of what it is to be an Aboriginal person and and uh, we're very self-determining and we want people to know our individual stories and um, I think you just have to go in with an open mind and, and just to listen. The, the organisation that we have, Community First Development, understands what's needed and we don't impose anything so they don't feel like they're doing things to people. And they understand the values of the organisation. It really is about nothing about us without us. You know, it really has to be driven from community. Okay. Um... Self-determination is very important and, and, and how we work with communities um, it's at the forefront of how we work. We're a national organisation and our community development um, um, team members are based in six locations. 
over the past 20 years, we engaged over, with over 800 communities and completed uh, 5,000 community development projects. In 2019 uh, to 20, we engaged with 159 communities across Australia on 209 community development activities. So it keeps, our work keeps us pretty busy. And there's a high demand out there um, in the communities in the work that we do. And part of our, and as part of our monitoring and evaluation journey, as a not-for-profit, we have an ongoing focus to strengthen our monitoring and evaluation capabilities. We kick off with a um, monitoring and evaluation and learning review in 2014 to 2017. And more recently, we've focused our learning through this three-year participatory action learning project with 11 communities. We'll be sharing what we learned in this research project um, about governance throughout this presentation. Um, so just, just to talk a little bit more about um, Community First Development, we, we're actually a learning organisation. So the key fundamental is that we learn as we go to improve how we work with communities and, and to capture the information how we work with communities and the data and information. Um, the next... Um, the next slide is about our story of change. Um, um, the story of change is the theory we work to. So in our theory of change, governance is, is one of the building blocks in, in uh, for communities to be able to achieve their long-term dreams. So the research project tested this theory uh, to learn more about the different forms of governance and governance practice. We dramatically changed the story of change as part of a research project. And it was originally a linear approach, a more traditional form of project uh, logic. Our team challenged this approach and as it did not show the in interconnected nature of the, how we work. And so we re redesigned our approach so it's more organic. Uh, like an ecosystem. Nothing's ever in a straight line, um, we found. And there's something that challenged us um, over, the, over the last three to four years. Um, and this is, this is our story of change. Um, so um, the next, um, I will hand you over to Sharon to talk further about um, uh, the activities that we're going to be talking in this seminar. Thanks, Doyen. Yeah, it was good fun um, redesigning this story of change. Uh, it was, yeah, really something else. Um, hopefully we get a chance to talk a bit more about that at the end when we're taking a few more questions, but do keep firing your questions off as we move through. I think Leah is sitting there ready to collate them all and hope we're hoping to have a bit of time to talk again. And I think Donna's got a few reflection points throughout the presentation as well, where you can engage with us. Cause I know we often feel like we're just sitting here talking at a screen all day or um, particularly in a webinar just to, to be listening. Um, but yeah, there is an opportunity to engage throughout. So keep the questions coming. So picking up where Doyen left off from um, about governance, this is a snapshot of the types of projects communities have been requesting over the past years, the past five years, four years. As you can see, there's been a growing interest in projects that lead to stronger governance. And this is one of the reasons that we decided to focus the recent research project on gaining a better understanding of governance with 11 of the communities we were partnering with. When we started the research project, all of the 11 communities had an existing relationship with us so we were already working with them on community development projects at the time the research project started. So the communities are spread across urban, regional and remote locations. And we've been partnering, we had been partnering with half of the communities for three years or more at the time the research project started. 
We were really stoked when 11 communities wanted to partner with us on this research. Uh, we didn't even know when we started if there would be an, in, an interest or an appetite for this work, but there was. After phase one, uh, one of the big discoveries was, yes, there's common knowledge that there are two forms of governance in operation in the communities, but there was confusion around the term governance. Um, for us, this work felt like a bit of a, what we call a fail forward moment. Um, we felt that some of the methods we'd used had really stifled the conversation that we were having with, with communities. Um, and as a result, we'd not learned much about the First Nations governance systems in the communities and the discussion around Western governance had really dominated the conversation. Uh, in phase one, we jointly completed a written matrix with communities uh, on governance, and we'd also taken a formal approach to our re research using a semi-structured interview. So we mixed things up for phase two. Um, after our fail forward, we adapted and we applied what we'd learnt. So this involved returning to what we were more familiar with here at Community First Development, and that was organic and rich conversations. Um, we framed this by creating a yarning tool, which had some visual prompts and questions. And the questions also had short explanations on what each question was about or what it was getting at. Um, this yielded much richer conversations, particularly using the visual prompts were really helpful. Um, we also tried different approaches to co-authoring co case studies throughout the project. Towards the end of the project, we, we think we had a more engaging way of interacting with communities using prompt questions and informal conversations together with staff where appropriate. This is something we're still learning about. Um, but it really was through a research yarning approach that we really started to unearth some of the challenges that occur in that interacting space between First Nations and Western governance. And I think Donna is going to talk a little bit more about that now. Oh, your mute's on. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon and Doyen. Um, so as Sharon and Doyen um, suggested, the community first development staff were exploring governance with organisations. Um, and there were different ways the term governance was framed um, by organisations and the people were working in them. Um, it was a really layered space that organisations were working in, and in, in particular, how governance was discussed. And I guess one il illustration, um, which is up on the screen at the moment, of why or how this occurs can be taken from the work um, completed by Aboriginal researchers at Yundamu, um, together with Dr Lisa Watts in 2017. Um, and this work was a part of a whole of community research on education pathways. And as a part of looking at education pathways, they explored um, some of the roles and responsibilities that people in community had. So Yundamu is a medium sized remote community in central Australia with around about 800 to 1000 people at, at the time of the research in 2017. Um, the community had a strong record of community achievements, which is sometimes lost in media. They also had quite a number of community focus boards um, and organisations, around about 14 key different boards uh, and organisations within their community, which addressed areas from age care to education um, to health and media. So the slide we're looking at here was produced as a part of their work. And it shows the network of, of activities and the boards in the community, um, which was around 16 at the time. The commu uh, and in this community, 12 to 14% of, of the community people um, were actually involved in these boards. Um, and many of them were on two or more boards and one person was on 17 different boards, one being external to the community. The boards themselves varied in size from three to 25 members. And while I mentioned that most had at least, that most of the people who were on boards were on at least two boards, 
um, some people around about 19 were on three or more boards and five people were on five or more boards. Um, so out of the 118 um, people involved, none were in leadership or management roles and most were in low level jobs. And most of the board members were actually volunteer, volunteering their time and were in unpaid positions. So I guess this comes back to, um, as the Walkley researchers noticed, noted in their report, the contrast between the board level responsibilities and the employment level is stark. But it also, I suppose, talk, tells us a little bit around Aboriginal communities and the complexity of, of the term governance and how they engage um, in governance within their communities. So we're just going to stop there, I suppose, and um, just see if there's any uh, questions or reflections so far. And I know we've got a few questions there, um, Lee. Okay, so one of the questions, I mean, there are, it's great, we're getting quite a few questions and they're really good questions as well. Like they really get you thinking. Um, just to go back a little bit, um, could one of the panel please um, have a bit of a talk about how the story of change was developed? I think that's quite important. There's um, a few, I think that would be quite interesting. Just the process or what made the organisation develop that, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy this story. I'll jump in, Doyen, and then I'll throw it to you if that's okay because um, I'll own my fail forward as a non-Indigenous person. I, I, I put together a, quite a basic program logic that served a purpose for us to start our, I guess, monitoring and evaluation structure. And, you know, I, the, I got feedback straight away. It's not right. It's not right. And we needed to work with it to structure some things to start with. And so it was really, really fantastic as part of this research project where we had a little bit of luxury of time um, to build it into um, looking at governance. So we were looking at governance and originally in the program logic, got, governance was, I was, I was quite, if you were looking at in, inputs, outputs, outcomes, I think governance was down the bottom somewhere, wasn't it, Doyen, which acknowledged that it was really significant in our model, but it still wasn't quite right. So that's when um, I had feedback. It needs to be circular. It needs to be interconnected. And as a non-Indigenous person, I'll say I struggled with that. I was saying, what does that mean? Explain to me, what does that mean? So we had a lot of yarns around this. And um, really, it started by sketching it as a circle. And truly, it was really funny for me because as soon as I put a circle and just started playing with it, everyone jumped in. But before that, it was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> What's that ugly thing? Um, so look, I, I, I think fail forward is important because without that, we wouldn't have had those discussions. I could have just dug my heels in and said, look, now nah, this is what we're having. Um, and then, yeah, Doyen and then Donna chimed in as well. So do you want to pick up from there, you two, on our ecosystem approach? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk because I... I knew it wasn't linear because of the challenges communities uh, face and it was more organic. Um, and I think uh, Donna come up with the ecosystem design approach and which fitted the, the purpose because just because A plus B plus C equals D, that wasn't necessarily the approach. Um, um, the challenges facing communities can be so much different and it didn't always work out that way and I knew that wasn't I knew that wasn't the case and the circular approach was um, kind of always been the thinking around well it's more circular and it's more interconnected but the organic the organic and ecosystem was um, was um, Donna discussed that with Sharon, and and that's how we that's how it was come up with. And I'll let Donna talk a little bit more about that. Um, thanks, Donna. 
I think um, one of the things that we really talked about and what struck me um, about the work that Community First Development does um, is the relationships. And um, I think we were having a conversation at an AES conference <laughs> or something around this, and it really did come back to the relationships. And so that fitted really nicely with um, the way that um, community first development um, works because, you know, as Doyen pointed out before, um, the relationships and going in and actually building those relationships first. Um, and then the second part, it comes from a strengths model because um, I guess, you know, when we're thinking around um, how ecosystems work, one part, um, you know, if one part isn't working well, it does actually affect all the other parts. And so I think our conversations really, um, you know, centred around some of that, around um, when communities are, are working, when they're thriving, those different parts of the community are building on their strengths and, and how do we show that in a, in a you know, two-dimensional model, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Do you guys have time for one more question before we move on or do you just want to move on? Yeah, I think we've got one time for one more. Okay, um, I'm sort of, there's one question here around, um, which I think is quite a, it's a good question because I know lots of people would be wondering is that when we have um, First Nation communities involved and participating in the projects and plus the research. One of the questions was, is that do they get paid for their expertise? But I think it's also important to talk about the relationship with the First Nation communities that Community First Development has as well. If you guys can share about that as, you know, or how that works, that process works and how the engagement happens. Yeah, I think, um... We're in a position where we go in by invitation from the community. Mm -hmm. So we just don't go in and come in with our own agenda. We actually get invited in the community, so we're welcome in to support what we do. And that makes our work a lot more easier in, in a sense of, of um, the community wants us there. It's not we come in and... and stamp our foot and say this is the way you do it we're actually invited by the community so the community actually wants us in there so it makes our work a lot easier and and building that relationship and everything it's all part of and trust it's all part of that um, next step in in developing activities or, or projects but I'll, I'll 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 let sharon talk a little bit further uh, yeah, picking up where Doyen left off, I guess monitoring and evaluation has been important for us for quite some time now, and we've really done a lot of investment into monitoring and evaluation. So doing the research was was quite new to us, and so we went through the IATSIS um, Ethical Research Committee and um, did the process for that, and I guess as part of that, we were challenged to think about the what are the benefits to community for the research? So we we landed back where what Doyen had said, you know, community development projects is the core, the core benefit, and they're projects that have been requested by communities. Um, so that's the key benefit. But then we are also hoping that, you know, obviously inviting communities to opt in. So it was their choice to, to be part of the research and in that we're hoping they saw some benefit for them. Um, one of those was the case studies that we were hoping would be able to be used for, um, say, funding applications or partnership development or general communications and marketing. Um, so th the short answer is no, we didn't um, pay communities for their expertise, but I would highly recommend that as an approach um, in, I guess, that it is suitable and would be a great thing to do in other contexts. But for us, using this participatory action research approach, it was able to be embedded into a project or program that communities had requested and we hope was was intended to benefit communities and was at communities request. So that's a long answer for a short, for a short 
response really, which is no, we didn't. Um, go ahead, Donna, did you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I think we'll, we possibly will talk about that in the next mm. couple of slides, but um, I do think that uh, the approach that Community First Development took um, throughout the whole process was actually um, a side-by-side -side model. And one of the things that kind of came through from the, um, from the data was that um, in the busyness of, of governance, of running communities of everyday kind of work, that um, there isn't always time for uh, people within the organisations to stop and reflect and think around what we're doing and how we're doing it and what impact is that having? What, what is, impact is that having um, on our organisation and on our community? And, um, and I think that, you know, if, if pay, payments can be in many different ways, and so the space that Community First Development created in actually um, working with those people who wanted to work with them on this project, it was an opportunity, the payback was that space and time to really reflect and talk about governance um, for themselves. And I think that there was, there was probably quite a number of um, learnings that happened um, through that process, um, particularly, you know, going back and writing the case studies and that sort of um, work that Community First Development did. Thank you. Um, I think we can move on now. That would be awesome. Oh, you're still on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the next slide um, really talks a, a little bit about um, some of these insights um, that the research findings from the Community First Development um, Action Research Project found. And the, the, as Sharon and Doyen have said, early analysis and some of our early underlying assumptions suggested that um, the Community First Development uh, partner communities, um, that uh, two-way governance um, could be one way to describe the governance in their communities. Um, and, you know, this is the picture that we've got here. This, this bridging governance was a, our early understanding. Um, but in actual fact, the, the two-way governance required um, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of work. And um, is there another another bit to that, Sharon? Is there a click on that on this bridging governance one? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Um, so the two the two-way governance really really were required um, navigation. Um, it required navigation of people, terms, language, reporting, um, both within their communities and with external organisation and funders. Um, this early kind of understanding of governance required negotiation of timeframes, of outcomes, of expectations and people. Um, and it, it really came from the necessity, it comes from necessity um, to achieve the social, economic, health and community outcomes that um, uh, all of these communities are, are wanting. And uh, what we did was we really unpack this through um, this underlying assumption of bridging governance. And in this space, communities were doing a lot of the heavy lifting um, and that two-way governance was really a, an assumption that needed to be challenged and one that suggested a current different model of working, which um, Sharon's possible. Um, um, and so here are, are a couple of the uh, interviews, um, snips that we got from some of the community members that actually suggested, um, you know, that this two-way governance model um, really needed to be challenged and some of the assumptions around it um, needed to be explored. And if we just move on to the next one. So we kind of 
went back and proposed a different model of governance, one that um, looks a little bit more like this. <laughs> um, so what was initially thought of as bridging governance, the model from community first data suggests that this is a more model, a, a more uh, current um, uh, illustration. There is no bridge into the third and intersecting space, only expectations and rules to be negotiated and navigated. Particip participating communities in the action research are seeking a more balanced model, one that particularly recognises the need for deep listening, for adaptation. It is place-based and it respects the cultural knowledge and practice um, of each of the communities. And so we want to move from this model, which is uh, kind of where we're at at the moment, to one that we call right way governance. Um, so right way governance provides an opportunities for communities to explore and strengthen community governance. And um, we did actually put in a research uh, application um, and unfortunately weren't able to get the funding so that we could really explore this right way governance a little bit more. And um, we had three communities who, who really wanted to work with us um, and unfortunately we, we couldn't get the funding. It's not that the work is not going to continue though. Um, so what does right way governance do? Right way governance holds accountable um, the Western governance and that previously assumed bridging governance model. And it asks the Western governance this, uh, to listen deeply and to give time to listen deeply. It asks for a bottom-up approach built on mutual trust, mutual respect and community ownership. Um, it values uh, community ownership and within that it values the monitoring and evaluation from community that has community-led outcomes and measures of success. Uh, Rightway governance understands the role of community ownership and delegated authority. And um, we will stop again here, um, just on the next slide, to have a, have a picture or, or have an opportunity for you as an audience to think about um, this process of right way governance and how it, how it might be enacted, I suppose, within your own um, research and evaluation models that you work from. And um, if anybody's got any questions, um, you know, we're going to have a little moment here to have a chat. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a couple of questions. One's actually on the research itself. Is, um, would you be able to sort of share a little bit more? Um, you briefly talked around applying for uh, funding for the research. Would you like, can you share a little bit more around the ethics? of the actual research project and what that looked like and how that happened? Yes, so yeah, <laughs> it took us through quite a journey, uh, didn't it, Doyen? So we thought we had a really good idea cooked up and then, <laughs> then we went through the research and ethics committee process and that was a huge learning curve for us as a organization, we got some really great feedback. I mean, we, I would call us a values driven organization. So the ethics in this organization continue to astound me from the top to the bottom and back again, um, at every level. And so as someone that's, uh, I guess, working with the community development team to design monitoring and evaluation approaches and all the rest, I'm always encountering values and going more oh, but does that align with our values? And, you know, is it by community request? Is it community driven? Is it top, top down? Um, is it providing the flexibility we need? So the research and ethics committee, um, I guess we went into it with a, 
an assumed knowledge. Oh, they should get all that. But no, we really had to document and evidence how we were doing those things. And so that took time and it took patience, especially because we were learning along the way. So thank you to IATSIS as we, the ethics committee, as we did our learning with them. Um, and I guess for us, as I mentioned, one of the things was uh, discovering through that process how to think about how the research would benefit communities. So um, that was really valuable. So I would recommend the process. I think um, it was tricky in that I think in some ways, uh, so back to I recommend it, I, I think it is really helpful. It was a fantastic process. One of the challenges was actually, I think we tried to be something we weren't. Um, we found ourselves getting caught caught up in all sort of sorts of technicalities that tripped us up in the first phase. Um, so I, I think we learned a few things in that about just being true to what we know works in in our model, um, and not letting that, I guess, stifle the amazing work that our CD team is already doing. I don't know, Dawn, did you have anything to add to that? No. Oh. Yeah, just with the ethics, it was, yeah, I, I knew it was very challenging. Um, I don't know whether I'm answering this right. Um, it was very challenging and and, a little, and and part of the process of all the way through that we had to learn and adapt our thinking all the way through the research project. So we discovered a lot of things which now we we have adapted in our community development practice, but also in capturing um, um, and monitoring projects and thinking differently. So, um, and we've done that through a lot of, uh, challenged ourselves through reflective thinking, going back, rethinking stuff. Um, and even even the just even going back to that uh, story of change, you know that that challenged us in how we adapt this model. It's about adapting and and improving the way that you do work when you're working with First Nations community. Don't assume that your way of thinking is the right approach. Sometimes you've got to adapt and 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 fit in with the current environment when you're working with First Nations community. And that's the challenging environment, don't you get me wrong, because there's a lot of barriers that are impacting on communities we work with, even even just, um, you know, we want people to thrive and grow and there's challenges and we've got to think outside the square and, and be solution focused. And, and I suppose a part of this research project is that we had to rethink a lot of stuff so I hope that catches what you're talking about. Anyway. Thank you. Um, do you have time for one more question or would you like, like to move it along? Oh, look, I'm looking ahead at the slides and thinking I don't want Dwayne to um, miss out on important storytelling time. So I think we move along. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm looking at the next slide and getting a bit excited about this story. Over to you, Joanne. Okay. I suppose when, when you're looking at a pathway to right way governments, uh, governance is that uh, one of the ways that First Nations organisation bridge into the third space is through a delegated authority. And there's a number of reasons for that. And one of them is pressures put on boards and, and, and um, people are, are spread out there's a lot of demands put on community organisation. Uh, for instance, uh, a place like Jigalong, they had something like 80 odd agencies going through there through what, in just one year only. So sometimes um, to bridge into that third space, what a lot of communities do is use the delegated authorities. And, and the delegated authorities are individuals that have highly developed schools in brokering partnerships, sourcing funding, and also navigating through that Western governance system. Um, they've been delegated authority by the elders or those in authority in the community. Um, 
to act on their behalf. And there's a and, and then there's very important responsibility that comes with this role. And it's an expectation that's undertaken. You know, you've got to do things the right way. And we are calling it this the right way governance. Um, the key component of their roles is listening and engaging with the wider community and also facilitate and understanding uh, community con consensus. Um, that's very important. And understanding the defined goals and navigating pathways through the Western governance to achieve this. Um, all while shielding and maintaining the community's cultural values, practice, and meeting also meeting cultural obligation. Um, it's the delegated authorities then connect through their community through Western governance, um, through a legal entity or other structures. Um, for here we had um, here's a picture of um, Thomas Cameron now. We worked with him for seven years to get back uh, Little Well, um, Little Well Reserve, which is on the border of um, Minu and WA. It's a former reserve, and many of the former residents um, were part of the stolen generation. They were spread out, um, and the Little Well Working Group nominated uh, Thomas to become their delegated of authority. And part of his role was to not only talk to the community, but also operate in that third space. And part of that was developing a MOU with the Shire or many of you to protect, um, to protect and put an interpreted trail on the Little Well Reserve. It was a very emotional time for them, for the Little Well mob. Um, seven years work and a part of that seven year journey they, they were awarded the NADOC 2019 Karen for Country Award um, it was a very emotional time it was, but also part of that journey was healing but Thomas lived out of a suitcase travelling many miles to make sure that he was engaging with his own mob and telling and getting their feedback um, of what they wanted on the reserve and also, as part of that, he become the spokesman or delegated authority. And not only enough, it's um, out of the 11 communities we work with, this is the only um, organisation that wasn't an um, incorporated body, but they were still able to achieve that by um, finding other ways or solutions to get back Little Well. So at the, at the moment, Little Well is preserved for future generations. Um, and that's that short story of a delegated authority and the importance of them um, stepping into the into that third space to 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 benefit the broader community to step up to the mark. Um, the next slide, I hope I catch it that right. Um, the next slide is. Um, is is um this is Devon Kumara um bending over with his son talking to Uncle Colin Peterson. And this is a slightly different model. They have a, a council of elders. Um he was delegated, been given a delegated authority by the senior elders in the community. And that was to start working towards developing an Aboriginal Males Healing Centre. He too, like um, Thomas, stepped into that third space. Because of many of the um, elders, Matu Nibali elders, um, talking with government was um, foreign to them. And... and Devon's role was to step, step into that third space, but also ensuring that the cultural values of, 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 of what the old people wanted, the elders wanted, were incorporated in, in, into that, incorporated in their plan and their plan for the future. So, and doing the things the right way was, was really great. This is Colin showing um, Devon on country um, and telling him 
about the cultural value of the land and looking at stone artifacts and telling these stories. And more importantly, Devon has a cultural obligation um, to those old people to ensure that he does things the right way and right way governance. So, um, anyway, um, I'll flick over to the next slide. Um, we studied our approach and comments from the communities come up with this definition, right way governance and practice. Um, right way governance are actions, approaches, and behaviour undertaken to empower people to meet community expectation. Right way is a familiar term used um, across many Indigenous communities and applied in different um, different situation. Importantly, right way governance are for everyone interacting in or with communities. Um, so right way governance is very important for First Nation people. Um, it's very important that because it's based on trust, respect, relationship, integrity and shared understanding. So it's very important. Um, when we're working with First Nations people. And that's one of the key findings that we come out of this this research. And um, I'll hand you over to Sharon. Thanks, Doyen. Um, so some of the key learnings we thought as we were putting this presentation together are really relevant for us in the evaluation space. So when we were working out what to say, we thought, oh, we'll dive straight into methods and approaches. And then we thought, hang on a second. As Doyen rightly pointed out, the finding, how do you engage with communities? Um, what do we personally know at, about First Nations governance practices, um, and particularly in a it, we're operating in a space where Western governance really dominant, dominates. This is something that we can all learn from. Hopefully some of the insights communities have shared can guide, have shared can guide and inform our practice. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, there's two reports from the project and they're available on our website and we welcome you to have a read. But we will now spend some time yarning about the practice learnings. So we've picked up some of the questions along the way, but we've left a bit of time here at the end, not long now, because we did take some of the questions throughout um, to look at the methodology and the approaches and answer any questions. Um, so we'll move along. Leah, as you know, has been collating questions while we've been talking. So over to you, Leah, with these prompt images up here. These are the different things we touched on throughout. So if the questions are about this, great. If they're not, happy to field other ones. And I know there's a few there. So we did talk about this. If we were, if we had too many questions and we couldn't get to them all, we'll endeavor to write up a blog and share it on our website and also as part of the AES blog series. Over to you, Leah. Okay, thanks, Sharon. I think we will be doing a blog. Um, just so that we can answer some of the questions more in depth. And we don't have time for that today. But um, one of the questions which is um, a re really relevant is around the yarning and research tool. Is how, how did you guys come about using that, the yarning and research, uh, the yarning research tool? Um, if you could share a bit about that and how that worked, if there was any fail forwards, yeah. Be good to hear. Doyen, do you want to pick up on that? I think. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, as an organ, as a community development organisation, uh, and as community development practitioner, one of the first things that we yarning has always been a part of our approach. How we engage with communities, even just when you get out on. On, on onto communities like, for instance, with Littlewell, you know, I walk through the long grass with um, Thomas Cameron, and 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 some members of of the Littlewell working group, 
to start having a yarn about just walking through the long grass to understand the importance of Little Well. And, and like with Devon Kumara with the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, it was already there. It's already embedded, you know. We just brought it out a lot more and it developed a more, um, as part of the research, a lot more um, um, as part of um, what we call, you know, sitting down and cup of tea is like sitting down and yarning in a circle and having a cup of tea and having a yarn and talking about things. So we went back to the more organic approach um, as part of the research and capturing the information. And I, and importantly, we we recorded a lot, a lot of these questions on what we found as part of the yarning and cup of tea approach is that we'll get a lot more richness in the information that was coming out of the data, even through the coding and analysis. And, and I think Donna can pick up a little bit on that, um, what, what she saw in the riches of the data by just yarning and and the uh, structure uh, yarning and using different tools I'll, I'll pass it over to you Donna oh, thanks yeah um I think one of the things that we did and and people have you know uh mentioned this is that um the way that community uh first development work um really uh kind of um, provided a very easy platform to use yarning as a, as a tool. And, um, but a couple of the things that we kind of talked about, so the, in the first interview, you know, talking about that failing forward approach is that um, community first development staff were kind of like, I'm a, I'm a, um, you know, I, I'm a, um, I'm a staff community member. Community I, I'm, not a, I'm not a researcher, kind of was what they were saying. I'm not a researcher and I'm not a, an evaluator. And so we did quite a bit of work. I think, um, you know, Nicole Lim uh, ran uh, communities of practice and we were actually able to come in and, and talk a lot more about um, strengthening practice from the community first development offices and just really um, using that strength to say, how can we use those conversations that you have to inform the work that, that you're doing? And so um, if we, once we, once they were kind of feeling a bit comfortable with that, um, I guess there are a couple of key things that we, we talked about. And um, one of those was that, um, you know, yarning provides a safe and familiar format, uh, that it is around providing the time, uh, you know, as Doyen said, going for walks in the bush and that kind of thing um, is not traditionally where, where research data is gathered. Um, but it was also about, um, it was also about uh, turning it around and uh, understanding that yarning, the, the, the person who's collecting the data doesn't have the control. It's the person who's telling the story who has the control. And the person who is um, collecting the data, their job is just to listen deeply. And so um, in listening deeply, they're not listening for a response that they're wanting to get from the, the people that they're talking to, but they're listening for connections and they're listening for um, you know, for these uh, kind of rich narratives. So the way that uh, we talked with the team was around how do you build on those responses? Can you tell me a little bit more about this? You know, um, what do you think that connects to? And so the kinds of questions that um, the community first development staff started to ask in their, you know, in their um, researching and evaluation um, uh, just grew richer through the discussions that we had as a team in those communities of practice. Does that, I'm sorry, did I? That answer? does answer, thank you. Um, do we have time just for one quick question? It won't be a quick question, but do we have time or have we run out of time? 
I don't think so. We're bang on one thirty. So, but we will we will write up a blog, everyone. I can see there's a lot of questions yeah. there. And I'm so keen to engage with you all. So look out for the blog. It'll be through the AES blog series, and we'll also put something up on our website. Um, and there's actually some blogs sitting up there now already around um, the seed to tree that you see up there on the screen, story of change. Some of the case studies are available and of course the reports. So we've got you covered there, but also Donna and I worked on a project with Better Evaluation and some, and some other amazing First Nations women um, was a couple of years ago now. It feels like ages ago, but anyway, whenever it was, the resource is still there. So that's another one um, that you might like to check out. And um, I, a quick re a quick cap of what's next overview of what's next for us. Doyen mentioned at the start we've got a webinar launch of our CD framework next week. So please do come along. You can register at our website. Um, and I think we, AES might even be sending out a little um, invite to that after this uh, presentation as well. So we're not done yet, everyone. We've got another action research project in the works. Um, as Donna's alluded to, we are looking for funding as well for, for more opportunities to engage around um, our research. So if you, if you know anyone, send them our way. <laughs> but also I've put that little image down there in the base of the um, bottom right hand corner. We've actually done something, had something really exciting happen just in the last few months. We've got an amazing Bidra man that works in our organisation that has Wayne Harvey who's developed a, an app in-house to how, that houses our monitoring and evaluation framework and this has just been moved to the cloud in the, this year. So we're really excited about all of the potential for that for our field team to capture data in real time and also all the reporting capabilities. So I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us on that. Um, plenty of opportunities to keep connecting and engaging with you all. But thank you so much for coming along. Um, yeah, it, we're privileged to, to share an hour in your day.